planning sessions, the reason why we do what we do, what your choices are. Some of you have already done this competition before, so you know that you've got choices about gi competition or no gi competition, etc., etc. But I'll just go through all the basics, and for the couple that aren't here, then I'll send them out this so they don't have all the questions. And by the way, I may not have addressed everybody's questions on the competition page of our website because it's got a list of FAQs, frequently asked questions. Like, you know, do I have to enter both competitions, like gi and no gi? How much does it cost? You know, etc., etc. There might be a few things concerning COVID requirements. So, if you've got any questions today and I can't, can't answer them, I'll write them down and then find out the answer and then send it to you. Uh, has anybody got any questions now before we start, before I start talking and before we start training? We've got about an hour and a half this morning. About the first 10 or 15 minutes is me talking. There's going to be a lot more drink breaks than normal because obviously it's, it's uh, warm. So I want, you know, we'll be on the floor off and we'll let ourselves cool down and we'll be back on the floor again. Okay. Um, the good thing about some of these uh, specific moves is the repetitiveness of it and just generally about our training, you've got to be, in this training, focused on where your arms and legs go. All your mental energy has to go there because in the competition, you can't afford to focus about where your arms and legs are. You'll be totally focused on your opponent. That's where your brain goes, true? So therefore, we've got to get over that hump. We've got to understand that we've got to do something regular repetitively on the floor here so it's natural and automatic and it's practically boring to you because if you're one of the competitors you stand on the floor you know you sort of do the bow whatever and then you touch hands and touch knuckles with your opponent then you're totally focused on them so that's why we do longer rounds here um okay uh, the rules are slightly different for this submission grappling tournament. It's called a submission grappling tournament, Kai, because of most Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu tournaments, wrestling tournaments, are points based. So if no one wins, like by a submission, they look at the points. If you get someone's back, that's four points. If you do a sweep, there's a certain amount of points, you know, three points for mount and so on and so on. So what they've decided to do is, there's no points, it's much easier to work out who the winner and who the loser is. The winner gets the person to tap. That's all that counts. And if after five minutes, no one taps, so you just battle for five minutes, there's no clear winner. So that's the guts of it. The other reason that I chose the submission grappling tournament is that you get about the aim is to give you a group of six and you fight each person, so you fight five times. You might end up in a, um, in a group where there's only two of you, like there's only two of you in yours, yeah. So you fought the same guy twice, didn't you? Yeah. So there, there might be that. But generally, you'll get a chance to fight. And um, Ash, you fought the same guys, both in gi and in no gi, didn't you? Oh, one person I only fought in gi. Sorry? Well, I, one person, I only fought in gear. That was one of them. But the rest of them, what, would there have been about four or five of them? There was five, including the dude that was in gear that yeah. I hadn't wrestled before. Yeah, but the other four, you, you fought them all in gear, and then later on, you fought them all in no gear. So they went in for both competitions. Yeah, so that's sort of what you can expect, because they're, gonna, they're not going to get brand new opponents just because you've now gone into the no gear. So your choices are, disregarding rules for the moment, you can say, hmm, I would rather compete in the gi because I like being able to grab something. Or you might say, now I like the idea of t-shirts or rash vests like um, Ash has got, so I'm going to go in for that. Or even say I'll do both like Ryan did. You did both, didn't you? What did you do? Just gi. Just gi. Anybody do gi and no gi? You did gi and no gi, didn't you? Huh? Tom did gi and no gi. So you've got a choice. Some people do both, some people do one. And sorry, what did you do? Did you just, just gi. Just gi. So he decided to do just gi. 
Are you competing again this time? Are you going to do D I'm or not? I'm already doing it. So he's going to change it this time. See, see, there's no rules about which one you have to, can or can't do or have to do or don't have to do. And that's what I'm going to do is over the next, we've got five of these sessions. Some of the sessions will specifically be G, some of the sessions will specifically be no G, and then towards the end you choose. So for instance, if you go, you know, I really like the no G, so I'm going to do no G, so the last few sessions you turn up in no G, and I group you as best I can. The uh, fees are on the SGT, submission and grappling tournament, the fees are on the SGT website. Now I think it changes depending on age and what have you. And on that website there will probably be information concerning COVID and masks and all that design. So that's something that we can answer later on as we go through. Um, a big thing with Margaret River people we are a bit more laid back than the highly geared Perth people, and there's no doubt about that. And you'll find that when you walk in there, the, a lot of the clubs are a little bit more intense than us. So get your head around that now, that you'll have to be dealing with the intensity of other clubs. And their young instructions and, you know, revving their kids up, and they look really more, not like a bikey gang, but they look a little bit more intense. So get your head around that now, um, and the fact that how intense they are means nothing when you step on the floor with another person your age and height and size. Who their parents are, what they dressed in, whether they were like, oh, beforehand, or like, oh, beforehand, it means nothing. What matters is your training, and how you apply that against a person who's in front of you. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, the reason why I put you forward into these, for me personally, is so that you can handle difficulty and it is stressful. And hence, there's 250 people in the club, look how many people are here. Not many. So I encourage people to compete, but I don't force them. Lil, are you nervous? Yeah. Fletch, you went where you? Fletch. Pardon? I was kind of, I think. Oh. Were you nervous? Yeah. See? Yeah. So yeah. some different strokes for different folks. Yeah. yeah. Was Gus nervous? I don't think he was, was he? Ryan, were you nervous? I was nervous like the lead up, but then I got to it like that. When you got to it, as in you got to the venue or got onto the floor? Because I was like five hours before my fight or something, I was like in the venue. <laughs> I was yeah. nervous that whole time when I actually got to the mat and wouldn't do that. Yeah, once it's on, it's on and you're fine. You're too busy about what's he doing, what's he... You know, you, the fact that there's a TV screen this big with your name and their name on it and people at desks focusing and there's, an, there's a coach or a referee in a certain uniform and looking at you. But once you go touch hands, touch knuckles, you're sort of like, uh, and then suddenly you go, oh my God, what's he doing? Or you think, oh, I've got a chance to do... So that's the idea is you're dealing with the opponent. So you've got to get over that now. So the techniques that I show you today are relatively simple, but it's your timing and your ability to pull it off or pull the trigger when it counts. That's the idea. So because if you half do a technique, you usually get smashed or rolled. Um, and finally, as I was saying about people from other clubs who are a bit more intense, regardless of how intense or aggressive they are or are not, I still expect you to show respect and humility to your opponent. Um, for instance, Ash got a kid in a Kessa with a figure four leg movement, and the, I think it was that one of the kids started crying, remember that? I think I was asleep at that I think, yeah, actually I do remember that. Yeah, I think you're on top. I couldn't quite see it because it was on the other way from the camera. Anyway, um, the kid got up and he was crying. I think he was just, it was just too much for him. I don't think you heard him. I think it was just too much for him. But you have to shake hands with each other afterwards. And then I think your mum called out to make sure he was okay or you just did it. And then Ash went over and sort of said, are you okay? So I think that's important not to celebrate your wins, 
and go, well, number one, and all that kind of stuff. That's not what we're about. The aim of the game is if someone gets hurt and, you know, they might twist their hand back or, you know, there might be a clash of heads, you make sure they are okay. So that shows that you're a step ahead of just someone who goes, I'm going to kill you, you're gone. So it's important to show respect and humility. Now to today. Um, you know this is a standing start. You are told, for instance, that you're on mat number four at 12 minutes past 10. And it's that specific. Mat number four, 12 minutes past 10. I'm a guy, and it's on a big TV screen. So you'll notice, so you assume up at mat number four, and then someone's gonna go, are you um, Ash Lewis? And you go, yep, and they go, on you go. And then he goes over there, are you John Smith? Yep, over you go. So you're standing there, and you're sort of standing there thinking, what do I do? Then they're going to go, get ready, get ready. Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Time starts now. Touch hands, touch knuckles, and you'll say five. So there's lots of things going on. There's three aspects to what the bout is all about. You are standing. The start, at the start, it's all about the takedown. Once it, that has happened, you're on the ground, it's all about the position. Once that has happened, it's all about the submission. So none of that is really new to you. But the takedown is something that a lot of you aren't used to. So we're going to concentrate a lot on the takedown at the start today. And I'm going to keep it really simple. I'm going to show you what is safe and what is unsafe. And as I explain it, you go, holy crap, that's true. It, it's sort of obvious, but it's not until someone explains it to you. And then we can just start practicing the takedown with your current knowledge of positions, Kai, mount, side control, all that stuff that you know and then submissions, and Bali, whatever, Matilda, whatever submissions you know is fine. Figure four, arm bar, it's just all the basic submissions. So we're gonna group them all together. So the, the valuable thing today, and Lil, you said this, was it was really handy doing the five minute rounds of getting the flow from one to the next to the next, from takedown to position to submission, but when you come back into the classes, you've done it maybe not hundreds of times, but lots of times, and you just flow straight through with another person. Yeah. So that's really beneficial, even though it's hot today, and, you know, it's gonna be difficult. Um, so with our takedowns, um, as we start in a minute, I'm gonna tell you about the dangers of doing some takedowns, because if I go to do a hip throw, I'm pointing my back to the person. And if the hip throw doesn't work, or if he swoons out the back, he's got or she's got your back. If I go to do a double leg, I'm exposing my neck to a guillotine. Now that's sort of obvious, isn't it? So you go, okay, well, hang on. The hip throw and the headlock takedown, that was one of our favourites. And Ash will tell you that in a gi, the headlock takedown is a pretty good one, because you've got grip. But in a no gi, you tend to lose the grip and they can get behind you. And we've got video of both those scenarios with Ash. Even though he was very successful, he now knows, okay, certain takedowns are better suited to gi, and certain takedowns are better suited to no gi. So we're gonna talk about that at the start, or have a bit of a practice of that at the start. There are three takedowns that I'm gonna show you today, three ways to go, and they are attacking the closest limb to you. It's pretty easy because when you're all nervous, you've got to have simple choices. Complex choices go straight out the window. Simple choices. Like when you're finally driving cars, if something bad happens, all that happens is your foot goes from the accelerator to the brake. That's just natural. Boom. You don't necessarily check the rear vision mirror and think that I cancel the indicator. None of that happens. Your foot goes accelerated brake and your focus is on the steering wheel toe. Same thing for us, we've got to think simplistic. That's what we're going to do when we stand up now, we're going to do a bow in. I'm going to show you the three target areas for a takedown, what's high risk and low risk, and how to do these three particular takedowns. And then we're going to start the five minute rounds. If you like a drink, you'll get a person who's similar height and size, and you're going to do takedown, position, Submission, stand up again, take down, position, submission, stand up again, and so on for five minutes non-stop. 
not against a person who's just dead and let you doing it, not against a person who is really trying not to let you do it, like in a real bout, but against a person who is just sort of moving with you and semi-lets you do it. Until in the end, after the one minute mark, you think, I've done the leg sweep, I've done the hip throw, I've done the headlock takedown, I've done uh, Mr. Allen's single arm drag to the back. What do I do? Do it again. Do it again. Trying to do the same thing over and over again. Because obviously the person, if you keep doing the single arm drag every single time, the person's going to realise what you're doing. You've got to have about two or three favourites, Kai. Two or three favourites and alternate between those. Now we've just done the single arm drag and we've done the guillotine. So now one person is leading. So Casey here is leading. He's going for a double leg and he's going for the guillotine. Or he might extend the arm out and he goes for the single arm drag. So now we've got a simple series of moves. So Fletch has just got to think of one of three things, but Casey initiates and the same thing for the rest of them. So we need to have all of this without thinking too much because we don't have the luxury of deciding what to do often. You're reacting to a situation, see? And sometimes that happens. So there's only really, Lil's only got two things to think of. She just got an arm drag, left or right, and a guillotine. But even then it gets confusing with only two choices. But remember, every time the choices increase, the number of choices increase, you need more time to decide. So the person makes a move. You've only got two choices, arm drag or guillotine. But the, nut, the amount of time that you need to make a decision increases. Hence, in a pressure situation, limit your number of choices. The more the pressure, the less choices you've got, you should have. So this is, so this is five minutes. Take down. Position, submission, and then same person repeats. Take down, position, submission. And we're trying to get zero thinking time. See? Zero thinking, see, he's just gone for the, the basic things you learn. So under pressure, you'll go for the basic things you learned. Here we go. Under pressure, you go back to basics and timing and strategy becomes important. Timing and strategy becomes important. Indecision gets you nowhere. Here we go, see, so he's gone low. Johnny's gone guillotine and they're working it out.